Okay then. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Karthik. I'm a graduate student in Singapore. I study biomedical engineering. Uh, I'm doing my research and computer vision is a very big part of the work that I do. Um, and so uh, I just like to give a bit of an introduction. I did my undergraduate studies in uh, mechanical engineering, so I didn't really have much of an uh, But I wanted to get involved because I wanted to get involved in uh, cancer research. And the opportunity was to study and classify different types of cancer to aid uh, clinicians with identifying diseases, uh, classifying them in medical images. Uh, Non-invasive imaging seems like a, a very promising you know, field. You can go for an MRI scan, a CT scan, an X-ray, and it helps to sort of identify whether you have an anomaly like a tumor, a fracture, but it's not enough to diagnose a disease. And what needs to be done if, uh, in order to do that is to, to uh, take a tissue sample from the anomaly, right? So when you, if you go to a, for a surgery to resect a tumor, to remove a tumor, the surgeon essentially takes a few tissue samples from the tumor site, um, and then that's, handed over to a pathologist, but the inter intermediate step of doing that is to stain the sample. And so histopathology is the, is the field that I work in, uh, work with. So what, what's done to the sample is it's put, uh, you know, a, a stain's applied, it's left for a few, for a while, and you get the, a contrast in the image that allows you to see features like nuclei or surrounding tissue. Um, the, this is a very big eosin or H and E staining. And what it does is the hematoxylin binds to the nuclei, the nucleic acids. The eosin binds to the other elements of the cytoplasm. And you can essentially see uh, the features like nuclei, blood, blood cells, uh, so on and so forth. And features in these images help a histopathologist, sorry, a pathologist identify what kind of disease it is. If it's a cancer, for example, you know, cancer is very prolif pro proliferative, apologies. Uh, the, the cells reproduce very quickly and it gets very cellular. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the nuclei can, can look very morphologically. Uh, morph morphology is a very fancy term for shape. Um, they can look abnormal in shape. They can be elongated. They can be oversized. Um, and that helps a histopath, uh, a pathologist determine what kind of disease it is, not just the, whether it's cancer or not cancer, but what type of cancer it is. And it's very important that they do that in order to guide treatment response, um, you know, to, to determine what kind of chemotherapy the patient needs, or even to determine things like clinical outcomes, prognosis, is it, is it a very bad um, sort of disease? Is it already necrosis? Have the cells died? Um, and because it's a human doing the job, there's of course a lot of inter-observer variability. You know, humans, we have our own biases. Uh, there's also, you know, you can have labs without pathologists available in developing countries. And it's become quite popular in recent research to have uh, computers come in and, you know, train to train them to identify these diseases in the images to either help clinicians or to even exist as some sort of inter intermediary between uh, the, the patient and the doctor when you need to, when they need to do um, diagnosis when the clinician isn't available. And when I got started, it was quite interesting. I didn't really have the resources uh, knowledge-wise to understand how to do these sort of classifications. How, how do I, um, I was essentially using a lot of open source software and I was applying, I was applying it to, to identify cells within the image to study their shapes. And I was using the, the numerical values of things like shape, uh, circularity, you know, are the cells very circular or are they very eccentric? Are they elongated? Are they large? Are they small? So on and so forth. I was using that to do classification without an underlying understanding of what computer vision actually is. How does it work? Um, because I wanted to produce results.
Oh, sorry. Okay. Is it better now? I think I've got to go come closer to the mic. Um, so the, you know, the more I studied these, uh, the more I looked at online resources and the more I understood the principles behind, um, the way these things work, the more I was able to appreciate these methods and why we do, um, why we modify them, why we use them, what are the problems we might face. Um, one of the things that inspired me a lot was the fact that the computer vision community is actually a very generous community. Um, you can actually see a lot of uh, resources provided to both learn about these techniques and to apply them. You know, if you don't have the comp computational resources, for example, uh, YouTubers like Aladdin Pearson, you know, they, they upload videos on, yeah, exactly it is. They, they upload videos on, you know, how do you use these techniques, how to apply them in code, how do you, you know, how they work, you know, uh, and, and they make it open to many people. And if you really, if you want to learn this from scratch, it's not exactly very difficult. Um, so this is actually one lecture in many, many, many lectures that you can find online. Uh, if you really want to get involved in the subject. The other thing is uh, to apply these techniques, you need a certain level of computational resource. Um, if you're here, because you probably have a graphics uh, processing unit, uh, like a NVIDIA GPU. But if you don't have those resources available, you know that they've also made that online. For example, the Google Collab, you know, gets you gets you access through the internet to GPUs. Uh, GPU resources. I think you can use that for free for about 12 hours continuously. So if you want to apply your code, if you want to run it, if you want to try these techniques, uh, maybe not the really, really complex ones like VR that um, Professor Jogrovsky was talking about the last time, but uh, if you want to apply the basic techniques and see for yourself how some basic AI works, the resources are available. And I was inspired by this generosity in the community and I thought, well, it would be fine, a fine idea to present those uh, a bit of basics at the science circle to get everyone, you know, anyone who's interested started, or at least to start a conversation. But computer vision is interesting because it has, you know, it's becoming more prevalent in many areas of, uh, you know, our daily lives or in the clinical context, for example, it's being used to diagnose images. Uh, to to identify disease where you know you have self-driving cars um, they, um, they they do make use to an extent uh, a com computer vision enables thing them you know cars to see things like uh, you know other vehicles bends in the roads um, objects like traffic lights uh, traffic cones uh, you can identify these things and then you can guide uh, vehicle you know, in, in its own automated automated driving. Uh, it's also used in in things like uh, Snapchat or Instagram filters that you know the things where you could put cat ears or or you know masks or even makeup on your face and or you could torment your friends with it. The idea is uh, you know it, it is everywhere. It's becoming more and more prevalent, and I think that it's important for us to understand how these things work at the base level. And in order to do that, I, I would probably start by talking about what a digital image is and what, what it's comprised of. And the first thing I did was I, I, I took an image of a, a chair, uh, it's from here. I uploaded it to MATLAB and what I got in response was this description of that image. And you will break this down, right? Uh, it says 231 by 208 by 3 uh, UINT8. So 231 by 208 is in the, in the number of pixels in the image. And the pixel is the fundamental element in describing an image. Um, a pixel is assigned a color you have those pixels, you put them together, you get horizontal rows, horizontal and <laughs> horizontal and vertical rows of pixels, and that together comprises an image. Right? 
so what's the what's the time three then? Um, now, obviously, uh, uh, these elements, you know, they're not just you don't have a grayscale image in this case. It's a, it's a color image, right? And you want to break that down into the different color channels. There's a red channel, a green channel, a blue channel. You can see that uh, where the the blue channel picture on the right is concerned, and if you compare it to the red channel image on the left, you see it's the chair is actually brighter in the blue channel image because it contains a lot more uh, blue blue color. But we can break images down into those three uh, components. So each pixel has about three values. If we want to see that in more simplicity, you know, we can uh, use a nine pixel image, right? Uh, you notice that there, are, you know, when we represent it in the grayscale color uh, mappings, we can see that there are uh, there are values that are assigned to each of these uh, color color channels, and these are called arrays. Um, And this is a three by three matrix, matrix essentially. So what's UINT8 then? That was the last uh, descriptor for the image. It's basically it basically refers to you know uh, an an eight bit integer, right? And it contains numbers from zero to two five five. That's essentially a scale for brightness. Zero is black, the absence of color. A uh, two five five can be totally white. Right. So if it's a uh, if it's red and it's completely red, it's it's pure red. Then that that would be two five five in red. And then if you look at the green array, it's zero. In blue, it's zero. If you look, if you are looking at the at, at white, for example, the bottom right hand uh, corner, you look at those channels. All of them are two five five. You add that together, you get you get white. Black is just the absence of color, so it's zero in all three of those channels. And so we can put those together and we can get different colors and we can describe them, um, describe an image. But, um, and, and there are different ways to represent uh, image, uh, images, right? Uh, an RGB image is what I described earlier. We can, of course, turn that into a grayscale image, which is just 0 to 255 for each pixel. And that's like uh, a black to, to uh, white. Um, I, I just like to make address your comments or questions immediately. I don't have that skill, unfortunately. So um, I'll, I'll try and do that after the. Uh, Oh, no, resolution depends on the number of pixels uh, assigned to the same uh, image. So, like, for example, I realized I should have talked about resolution. I didn't. Uh, you could take the same image of that chair. It's 231 by 208 now, right? Let's say we increase the number of pixels assigned to this same image. You essentially, you're essentially seeing the same thing, but you'd get a higher resolution. You get better quality. And you'd be able to, you know, you'd see the edges a lot more clearly. You get to see those, uh, the curves in the chair would be a lot more, you know, defined. It would be a lot more interesting. So resolution is essentially just the, uh, it's a, if you want to look at image quality, it's the number of pixels that are assigned to the same image. Of course, that affects the size. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, it, it's the same to when they compare t TV screens. Um, no, it's not. It's not going to be diagnostic imaging. Uh, I'll talk about that later. Uh, okay. So, I do, I'm not talking about the points function here. I better research that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we can represent images a few ways. One is... Uh, we can do it in RGB, red, green, and blue. That's the one I described earlier. Uh, we can do it in grayscale, right? That's an easier way to represent an image, 0 to 255. The, we can also, you know, if we apply a threshold, let's say we introduce it about half the, uh, half, half of 255, we can, we can essentially convert an image to a binary image, right? Uh, represent it in zeros and ones. So, so that those are different ways to to sort of represent image images. The next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to try and 
identify features in an image. And I realized this is not really intuitive. One of the things that computer vision allowed me to, um, you know, help me do was appreciate how easy it was for me to, uh, to see something and intuitively sort of uh, immediately determine, ascertain what sort of object it is. I didn't, I don't have to think about pixels when we don't have to think about pixels or pixel values or grayscale imaging or red G, RGB. Um, when we, when we talk about is a chair, a chair, is a car, a car, is that a cat or is that a dog? But when we use, uh, when we upload pictures to computers and we try and manipulate them, we essentially need to play around at first. But having this um, matrix of numbers, this representation, allows us to manipulate the images to extract features. And that's essentially what this, um, the first part of this lecture is going to cover. So one of the things we can use to determine, uh, distinguish images, for example, if you're talking about uh, cars or motorbikes or aeroplanes, for example, you, you, you want to look, you, there are th certain things that help you determine what sort of vehicles these, these are. A propeller or a turbine engine on an aeroplane would help you determine that it's an aeroplane, ascertain that it's an aeroplane. The wings on an aeroplane, you know, are paramount to knowing that it's an aeroplane. On a motorbike, for example, you have two wheels. On a car, you have four wheels. Just like if you are differentiating a cat or a human, a human has two legs. A cat has a, has a different, uh, a cat has four, four legs. So you, you would essentially be looking at these high, high level features, we call it, in order to determine and ascertain for yourself whether or not those, you know, are those, um, what, what sort of image is it referring to? What sort of object it is in the, in the image? So we want the computer to be able to do the same thing in order to image it is. And in order to do that, we first have to start from the basics. The, one of the things that, you know, we, we start from, we start from lines, edges, and dots. Uh, it's, these are called low level features. We want the easiest thing to extract from, uh, you know, an array of, of numbers. Uh, is lines, edges, and dots. And the, these are called low-level features. We put those together and we can get the mid-level features, we can get high-level features. Um, I, I took this image out from um, an open source, sorry, a website online, but I think uh, Alexander Amini, who's a lecturer at MIT, he has a very good lecture on uh, deep learning that I suggest you follow up on. And he's got a better diagram than I do. I didn't want to copy that. But uh, what he he uses it to introduce low level, mid level, and high level features on human images. The low level features are essentially the lines, the edges, the dots. The mid level features are the the facial features. For example, the nose, the eyes, the ears, uh, so on and so forth. The high level features are then the fe face mapping, and you know knowing those low, the mid level features like where the ears are, where the eyes are that facial mapping that will therefore allow us to identify um, you know those features for snapchat filters for example where do you put the ears where do you put the nose uh, that and how do you distort the image to make it more interesting i suppose uh, but let's talk about the low level features how do we how do we extract those first the way we do that um, is we apply something called a filter through the to the image. And a uh, filter is just, you know, it's a, it's another array. It's a smaller, you could, it, it could be a three by three array like this. And what we do is we move that filter along the image. Um, there might be different step sizes involved, but essentially what happens is if you look at it, we multiply, we do an element wise multiplication here. 
um, look at the red array and look at the look at the red matrix and look at the blue blue matrix. We are essentially multiplying the elements in the same position. So one times one plus zero times zero plus zero times one plus one times zero plus one times one plus zero times zero plus one times one plus zero times zero plus one times one. All that added together gives us the four on the right, and that's sort of like a feature map. The um, we could apply it to the one below, right? Uh, the red the red box that I've highlighted. It's the same thing. One times zero is one. One times one is one. No oh, more. Essentially, the the sum is is three. And this year, it's called a convolution. I'll come into I'll, I'll go into uh, convolutional neural networks uh, later on, but this essentially gives us a feature map of you know, from the original image. It helps us to pick out features. And, you know, this doesn't, this may not seem a lot to you, like a lot to you when I'm looking, when we're looking at it uh, numer numerically. But uh, if you take the image that I used for the promoting this lecture in the abstract, there was, a, there's an edge detection operator. These, these are essentially uh, Sobel filters, they call it. It's interesting because these are edge detection um, filters. What they do is either detect horizontal or vertical edges. You notice if I apply the first one, look look clear, uh, quite closely at the text, uh, the sign circle. You'll notice that uh, the application of different f filters allows for either the detection of vertical edges or the detection of horizontal uh, edges. So we can, by changing, you know, the values in these filters, these convolutions, uh, we can essentially detect um, different things. And the way it works is by identifying the differences uh, as an image goes from gray to black or black to white, you know, as it gets brighter, as it gets darker, you start to see these these edges. And as you apply those multiplications, you start to see, uh, it, it starts to become more definite uh, when you get the output feature map. And so um, that's very interesting because we can now make use of those features to identify those mid-level or high-level features like face, eyes, and all that. And um, I'd like to talk a bit about neural networks because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put these features into a neural network. And we're going to use that to apply a simple artificial intelligence protocol to identify, to, to get the computer to classify an image. And this is the basic structure of a neural network. Um, first off, I want to make a disclaimer. This is a very simple image that I found online. The lines that are going from each input can actually go to every other input in the next next layer. Each vertical column of circles is called a, a layer. The, and each circle refers to a neuron. And a neuron could be an input. Uh, it could be, you know, an output after multiplication. Um, and essentially what's done is the features from anything that you're trying to classify are placed um, that x1, x2, x3, uh, up to x33, x34. This is 36 features in this in this case. Uh, what's done is these features are multiplied and ended, and added, you know, to by a certain number of weights. The the connecting lines are essentially um, the channels, and they are they are multiplied by weights in order to give us the next layer, um, which is called the hidden layer, the, which is, you know, the features uh, uh, extracted. So what, what's done is these multiplications happen over and over and over until we come to the last layer of neurons. And in this case, it's three, sorry, it's three neurons. Each neuron corresponds to an output. So in this case, there are three classes. It might be cat, dog, cow, whatever. Uh, what happens is when we apply these, these multiplications, we add them together, uh, we can either, we, we send them into something called an activation function. 
And an activation function, it's a sort of threshold that determines whether or not a neuron will be activated or not activated. Uh, you can see that some of the neurons in this, in what that means is after passing the sum of those weights multiplied by the sum of the features, uh, it's reached a certain value that has caused it to activate. And these activations continue until, um, you know, we reach the output and it determines a certain class. And this is called for forward propagations. The, the multiplications are happening in the forward direction. But this isn't the end of the story because, you know, this, the computer is essentially just making a guess. The weights are not, you know, uh, the, we the weights may not really be optimal enough for it to give a correct classification. Um, one of the things that I think George, uh, Professor Jokowski has previously talked about that I, I, I should have mentioned in this lecture is um, the difference between unsupervised and supervised learning. Um, this is a case of supervised learning. What we fed into the computer is not just the input, whether it's an image or whether it's a, a set of numbers that correspond to a certain diagnosis or classification. We've also told the computer what the classification is. We've told the computer that this image is a, is a, is a cow, this image is a cat, this image is a car, this image is a plane. And by feeding these classifications into the computer, we're essentially what's going on and in order to train the network the computer essentially wants to get these classifications correct so when it identifies by the end of the forward propagation um, you know that run uh, that it's not reached the actual class it means that there are errors involved and it will use those errors to go back to re, you know to to go back into these uh, in, into the layers of the network to modify the weights in order for it to achieve an optimal result that reflects the actual class and it will keep doing this forward backwards forward and backwards until it reach it gets an optimal classification that corresponds with the values that it was fed and i think this is one of the most it's a beautiful thing about artificial intelligence that a computer is able to, you know, by itself learn, you know, back and forth and back and forth. We do have to make some mathematical sort of adjustments. Uh, how many layers do we use? Do we increase the number of hidden layers? Do we use something like a, a, a dropout? I won't go into, into that. But, you know, this, this cycle of forward propagation, back propagation, doing this over and over again, that's essentially what uh, deep learning is. And it's, you, it, once we've done that, we can on images that it hasn't seen before. And that essentially, you know, would allow us to classify new images and to use it in contexts like healthcare. Um, and we, and it's, it's an amazing thing. That's what I think. But this is, this is a very, this is just an artificial neural network. Uh, CCG, I think, was mentioning something be called uh, convolutions, right? So there's a convolutional, there's something called a convolutional neural network. If we're dealing with images, we are essentially using a convolutional neural network. And this is what that is. So what this does is essentially it, uh, it applies the concepts that we learned, uh, that we discussed earlier. A convolutional neural network is quite similar to an ANN. The interesting thing is um, what I discussed before, the convolutions that are applied to the image, you know, those um, filters that are applied to the image, the ones that determine and, and you know, extract the features like the lines, the basic features like lines, horizontal lines, vertical lines, edges, so on, so forth. Those are the same weights. Um, those are weights that are applied to the pixels. And those are the weights that the computer wants to optimize in order for it to perform uh, that those 
classifications. And so the purpose of a CNN is not just to one preserve the feature features that are paramount to getting a robust prediction. Um, it wants to extract those features as it goes along. Those low level features like uh, lines and uh, edges and so on and so forth would then translate in, as it goes down the network. It would translate into high, mid level and high level features. And by the time it comes out into a fully connected layer, it you know at the end it would be able to classify the image based on high level features. But it also wants to simplify uh, the images into forms that are easier to process. What do I mean by this? Uh, you know, this training with a neural network, it takes a lot of one memory and two, it takes a lot of... Uh, it, on my laptop, I remember that my graphics card and my CPU uh, heated up to about 96 degrees when I was training my convolutional neural network. Not the smartest idea. Um, and I was training it for about an hour. So an hour at that temperature, you know, things were frying. I, and so, so one of the ways, you know, the CNN deals with it is along with the convolutional layers, after every convolutional layers, um, you get the matrix result. And what happens is you then apply something called pooling. And pooling serves to raise reduce you know the size of a matrix while preserving the features as much as possible um, there are two different types of pooling one is called max pooling uh, if you look at we this uh, four by four matrix we've essentially broken it down into four components and we take the maximum value from each of the components and we transfer it to a smaller matrix that's max pooling average pooling of course takes into account the it just takes the sum of the components, divides it, and then gives you an average value. One of the advantages of using a pooling technique is it gets rid of unnecessary noise, for example, in the image. So um, it's a convolutional layer and then a max pooling layer. A convolutional layer, a max pooling layer. Feature, re feature extraction, simplification. Feature extraction, simplification, so that it's easier to process. And at the end, you know, um, we looked at the artificial neural network earlier. It was a single row of neurons, yes. So what we would do is we would take the two-dimensional image and we would flatten it um, into a single um, sort of uh, feature vector. And that would be used in the neural network to classify the image. To be um, this simple, Right, you notice that there are only two sets of convolution and max pooling layers in this image. It doesn't. Um, this is the VGG16 network. It's it's, uh, it was proposed in a research paper. It contains about 16 um, of these uh, convolutional layers and max pooling layers, all that added together. It essentially does a lot of feature extraction. And the, the term deep neural networks the depth of a neural network is, refers to how many layers of these convolutions and so on and so forth that you have. And we would, we would essentially, you would essentially apply these to your problems based on the complexity of the image that you have. If you have a lot of features in the image that need to be detected, if you have a lot of those, if the complexity is very high, then you probably need a, deep, a deeper network. Um, it's not always a case that you apply, you know, when you apply a deeper network, you get a better result. Um, I do, I'm working on a research paper that I found out that my simpler network actually produced better results than this VGG16 network. basically use these uh, for a multitude of tasks. There are different sort of computer um, computer vision classification tasks that are involved. A few, one of the basic ones is of course image classification. Uh, the simplest ones, the ones that I learned in my uh, online were like the distinction between cats and dogs, for example, right? So if 
for example, if you, you know, if you want to classify a cat and you want to classify a dog, you're looking at different features like ears, um, how they're pointed up, what's the shape, what's the morphology. Uh, in cancer detection, for example, is there is it a can is it a benign cancer? Uh, sorry, is it benign tissue? Is it cancer? That's the simplest way to think about it, right? Um, but you could also be doing things like cancer subtyping. Um, there are different there there are correlations between the morphology of nuclei in tissue images that correspond to a certain uh, genomic classification of the tissue. So, and that would sort of help us determine whether or not the cancer, the patient has a better prognosis or will they respond to a certain sort of treatment better. And it's it's becoming more and more interesting to use uh, deep learning in these applications because they're able to see things simultaneously. They're able to study a lot of images uh, together for large, uh, large numbers of images. Um, the I've been using about ten thousand for training, and uh, I I just find the number of the fact that you can feed a lot of images into these networks to train and differentiate them at the same time interesting. But one of the things that's important, or one of the challenges that's involved with image image classification, is the fact that you know the. As the same class of image, you know, uh, a dog, uh, a dog could be standing. They could, you, an image of the dog could be captured from the side, right? The dog could be leaping in the air, or it could be sitting down on its hind legs. You wouldn't be able to see the front legs. Um, in the staining, for example, in in staining, for example, one of the big problems is that there's a lot of stain variance in the images. When uh, one of the problems that we had with our pathology images or the, the H&E images that we were using is that when they were ex exposed to white light microscopy, um, bright light microscopy, uh, the stain started to wear off. And so you get some samples in which the contrast was very good, some samples in which the contrast between the hematozylin and eosin, the pink and the blue, wasn't so clear. And when you have those differences in images, it can create trying to train a system that has looked at a certain set of images and a system that hasn't looked at a test set of images, which is how we evaluate um, these deep learning techniques. We can, if, if it's not able to take into account these differences, then it's a weak uh, classifier. So how do we deal with that? How do we, how do we solve those issues? Well, one of the ways is uh, data augmentation. And it sounds like a fancy term, it's not. Uh, it's essentially just a very sneaky protocol in which we might uh, take an original image and create uh, you know, clones of it, but modified clones. For example, you could stretch um, the image of a dog. If, if you capture a dog from a certain angle, of course, you, know, you would see that it's sort of squeezed uh, just like the image on the top right. So we could essentially augment images in many different ways to account for those variations. When we can't see them in the data set that we have, we could even apply color um, color filters or you know um, sort of uh, color modifications that allow for uh, for the computer account to account for things like you know when you're driving uh, the um, is there rain? Is it? Are you doing in the, in it in the night, um, and light variations and so on and so forth. So, so this is an interest. Another thing is if you don't have a very large data set to, to, to operate on, um, you can essentially use something called transfer learning, and transfer learning is very interesting because, uh, people have uploaded complex, complex networks like Inception, Inception V3, uh, which was developed by Google, VGG16, which is the one that I showed you earlier. It's a very complex ne network. And uh, if we don't have a very large data set to train these networks on, we are not able to extract features. We're not able to see features well enough for us to build a robust network. One of the ways to deal with that is to use pre-trained networks. 
And people have generously also uploaded these networks. They train them on something like uh, ImageNet. And ImageNet is a repository of, um, how should I say it? Maybe I should use Donald Trump's way of saying it. Millions and millions and millions of, to put it precisely, 14 million images of many different things like cats and dogs, uh, boats and cars and shoes and all those things. It's a huge repository of images. And these networks have essentially been trained on the ImageNet database, and they've already been trained to identify features in these images. You could essentially use the trained networks, the transfer learning networks, that, are, that have already been trained to data set. So if you don't have a very large data set to train your, your network on to, to have it identify features, you could use uh, transfer learning methods. And you know what you, you what you do is like the convolutional layers would essentially have the features already mapped to them. They'd be looking for those features in the images. The end would be the 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 artificial neural network. You could do the classification that way. Um, I found that as a, a very useful in dealing with my studies earlier on when we had very limited samples and we wanted to test the effectiveness to show the doctors that this thing actually works with some level of accuracy. Um, the other advantage of transfer learning, of course, is if you have a lot of data and you're trying to train a neural network with it, you need a lot of memory, you need a lot of computational power. And if you don't have that, you know, uh, this having this already pre-trained pre saves you from burning your, your computer. And the, the next thing we could, of course, you do, you know, once we've trained our computer to classify images is we could have it identify objects within images, right? We could pass a window over the image and we could essentially get it to classify areas within the window and within a window and have it ascertain what are the objects in the image. And that's object detect. If we are talking Testing, one, two, three. Yeah, I switched um, my, my, my expensive microphone is not working. Jeez, it's, uh, but, but let's take it a step further. Um, I'm using my laptop's mic now, so sorry about that. Let's take it a step further. Um, we could we could continue um, from from object detection and from object feature segmentation from from um, detection. We could essentially do object tracking. We could observe where people are going, you know, in a day to see what their preferred modes of transportation are, um, and we could optimize uh, the you know, transport systems and all that by seeing these images. Um, of course, there's there will be probably big sort of debates about, uh, you know, privacy and, 
and those sort of things when we do when we do this. But uh, you know, uh, it it enables video rate tracking is also quite interesting for using probes in medical imaging, for example, when you want to see live Im images and a doctor is using a probe on a tissue sample and wants to identify tumor within the tissue, the, the probe's moving, right? So if you want to track the tumor as it goes across, that's also another thing that you could do. Um, getting, getting these systems to work um, in video rate techniques is a very interesting um, challenge that's also ongoing. And we could also do things like uh, extract segmentation. Uh, this, slide, this slide's got an error. It's not object tracking, it's called object segmentation. Uh, and what it's trying to do is extract uh, things like nuclei from, uh, from the cells. If we want to study the shape of each nuclei separately, we could essentially uh, ex extract, and we, need, we want to study the boundaries of the shape that's involved. That's an advanced level um, mode of image classification. It's not only identifying what the image is, whether it's a person, it's a car, whether it's traffic light, it's also identifying the boundary of the image in order to understand where its limits are. And that could you know, further help the guidance of uh, systems like uh, self-driving vehicles. One of the, but um, what I really want to get get back at here is that um, you know I've shown you these techniques I've I've mentioned to some with some level of simplicity the I I've talked about what the basis of these techniques are what an image is what uh, how you process it and how you you know how a computer extracts features from it. What I'd like to encourage a little bit, if you're interested in these techniques and you want to continue to do them, I need to emphasize that the online learning community for deep learning is extensive. For computer vision, it's amazing. Um, I've mentioned Aladdin Pearson and uh, Alexander Amini. These are, they have produced some profound lectures, really um, great lectures about the, the topic. Uh, Alexander Ami, uh, sorry, Aladdin Pearson actually gave me insights into how I should install the software in my computer because I had a lot of problems installing and getting it to link with my GPU. And watching his videos actually saved my, my butt, <laughs> actually got me and it helped me to get started. I am I am still quite grateful for the work that these people have done. Um, and I think if you are really interested, you can actually check out their, these these channels. I recommend them. I've also mentioned um, open open source uh, sort of things. Uh, when I started doing deep learning, I was learning it on Google Colab. Google Colab essentially is an online coding interface that allows you to use Google's GPUs, public resource GPUs. If you want to perform some basic deep learning classification, or try these techniques for yourself or get involved in AI, it's not really that far away and it's not really a niche industry. If you wanna, you can watch those videos. You can use these resources online if you want. Um, Kaggle is another platform that provides uh, open source deep learning uh, you know, resources. You could use these and use them to your advan advantage if you wanna you know, further your projects to, to you to do classification or to study trends or patterns in your, um, in your data sets. But the most important thing I think is that AI is, AI is becoming more prevalent in, in discussions as it becomes more prevalent in industries and our daily lives. Um, a lot of articles have come out about um, you know, moral dilemmas about whether or not these we should be scared of these things, whether or not they are really feasible, whether or not they're really useful. Uh, it's I think I think that an understanding of the basics, uh, an understanding of you know pixels and uh, all the boring stuff that I've shown you so far, is useful in helping us make 
objective assumptions or, or you know objective or having objective discussions about these topics uh, there's a big thing about artificial intelligence it's called the ai black box it's where a certain a network is trained but a person like a doctor who's going to use their network to make a diagnosis at the end doesn't really know what's gone into training the network and i think an understanding of these techniques um, the way they work uh, there are a lot more things that i haven't mentioned the cnn is just one way of doing this this analysis there are things like support vector machines um, linear discriminant anal analysis that um, older machine learning techniques that you could also use but it's an understanding of the basics that will probably help us alleviate the trepidation that we might face with this black box problem and with that i don't really have a thank you slide because i wanted to save 10 lindens on uploading but I really want to thank you for this opportunity. I understand that it's the Science Circle's um, 500th presentation. Um, and I think I really owe it to thank uh, Chantal and, uh, you know, the team like Phil, George, Professor, Professor George, and um, many of the other people who have come thus far to present some amazing topics. Uh, and uh, to to talk to talk about these and to to deliver this knowledge to the public i hope you have enjoyed this presentation i really enjoyed preparing it for you thank you so much Yeah, uh, maybe if there, there are some things that we want to uh, wanted to talk about. I think Shiloh was mentioning the idea about 3D imaging, right? Um, so uh, I don't, I don't, I haven't really dealt a lot with the 3D images yet, but I do know, I, I would think that a 3D image is actually, it consists of slices of 2D images. An MRI image, for example, you know, you scan along a certain axis, you would get sets of 2D images. And I would think that if you want to classify a 3D image, image, you would essentially use the classification in the 2D space and apply it to those uh, the slices and then reconstruct the image in 3D. Um, there are some amazing things like finite element analysis, for example, um, where an image is broken down into smaller, smaller objects and classification and things are done to those, to those objects and to those smaller segments of, of um, 3D object, you do the classification, you perform the re reconstruction, and then you might get a, a 3D mapping, for example, um, a heat map of tumor per se. And yeah, that's, uh, that's the way I would think 3D images are handled. Uh, got a private message from Sumo that I think is going to make me cry. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, so kind of me. The, I, I really wanted to, this lecture has a lot of missing content. I have to be honest with you. Um, I think uh, CCG mentioned uh, raster, sorry, uh, the point spread function. There's not, uh, I haven't talked about that. I haven't talked about, um, you know, uh, Gaussian curves and pixel in intensities. Uh, I, I, there, there are a lot more topics that we could we could raise from computer vision. I, I could come up with a more comprehensive lecture on this, uh, eventually. But I think I should also leave you in the hands of the many people who have come before me and uploaded even more profound content on the internet. <laughs> uh, the you know the the people from MIT Open Courseware, for example, incredible people that have. Uh, uploaded content. Also talk about other areas of artificial intelligence. Um, 
national, uh, sorry, natural language processing, for example, uh, the use, you know, the study of words, sentences, Compu computers are able to complete poems to some level of, uh, you know, uh, beauty. <laughs> They're able to produce music uh, these days. Uh, as a musician, I, I do find that a bit scary, but it's, it's interesting the things that they can do. Uh, processing signals, sequences, uh, you know, we could have a lot more discussions about AI and the various things that we could apply it for, not just computer vision. And I, I just hope that this basic lecture continues to start a series of lectures. If there's any one of you that's involved um, in, in this, then we could, you know, we could continue. A fireside chat would be, yeah, it's a good idea, Stephen. Yeah. Ah, yeah, definitely. Because, okay, I, I have to apologize. I had an exam this week on Thursday. Um, and next week, I think I'm going to try and work on completing my, my paper for <laughs> my manuscript. So, I'll discuss this with uh, Chantal and I'll think about it. I think it has a lot to do with the data set. Um, you know, with patient samples in pathology, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest concerning things that we have is uh, when, we, when we train it on a certain patient, cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, for a certain patient, it can look like a certain, the cells, you know, be, they have a certain shape and size. You could look at another sample from another patient, it's the same disease, uh, it could look completely different. Uh, and it, it's so heterogeneous that training it on a few patient samples is not enough. And if you want to, pub my, one of the biggest problems that we have when, you know, publishing is determining whether or not we've gotten enough stem samples from different hospitals. Uh, so we, we want it from, not just from different hospitals, but different hospitals might have different imaging modality, uh, quality, right? Uh, more, the better funded hospitals would have better slide scanners for pathological images, you get, a be get better quality. So it's about having the spread of, a spread of images with a diversity that's, uh, enough to have it and pictures. Uh, of course, the training time is longer, but you read the benefits of having a more robust classifier. Uh, I think, yeah, I do think that, that samples are actually very important. Oh yeah, that's actually um, one of those, one of the more detailed uh, things to talk about in training a, a neural network is uh, the splitting of data sets. There is a training, a validation, and a test data set. So a computer can be trained for, if you have an entire data set of so many images, you could break it down into 80% training and 20% test uh, validation. What the computer does is it trains on the training data. So it's made a classifier on the training data. It applies it to the validation data set that it hasn't seen yet. And then it determines whether or not it's being biased or not. Um, and so, you know, the validation, validation data set is also, is also quite important. It's very important that a computer evaluates itself on before. That's the important thing. Uh, you need to account, and, and you know the people who help you split a data set. Those are very important. Uh, the the doctors who who might have knowledge on what future samples will look like, who have experience in diagnosing diseases, the pathologists, the the surgeons. These these are the people that are important in you know helping you 
develop your your data sets to choose to do the annotations where is the tumor where is the normal tissue it's very important to have those people on your side if you're planning to do any project in artificial intelligence or deep learning i i strongly suggest that you have those people on your side um, to to collaborate with them it's it's a blessing that i actually got to meet doctors and work with them because they are fantastic you get you get a lot of knowledge about disease um, from talking to doctors um, that was yeah it's it's and it's fun to 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 work with them on these uh, projects the experts uh, the people you're trying to help one thing i learned in engineering um, is you know always try and work with the people you're trying to help uh, and always try to empathize with their problems and understand it from their perspective because the better you do that the better you understand your your the problems engineering solutions are Not that I have a lot of experience with it, but in the brief years of education that I've had, that's, that was the biggest uh, lesson that I learned. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd actually like to, I, I, I do invite more people to actually come up to talk about these topics. I have to tell you that many of the concepts that I'm talking about now, in, in, in fact, this coming up with this presentation was also very useful for me because I didn't, I didn't really think about the basics as much um, before. I, I did take a module in computer vision um, and I, I did learn some, some of those basics, but I, you know, in the midst of applying the techniques to problems and, you know, having those online resources or, or code readily available, you tend to forget about these principles, um, about the building blocks that make up a classification network. And, and in a way, pre preparing for this presentation was also very useful for me to get back to my roots, uh, to the roots of these things and to understand the, the basics of uh, uh, me as well. So yeah, thank you, Shantam. I'm really grateful. Oh yeah, um, intraoperative uh, diagnosis is also very interesting. Uh, the lab that I work with actually deals with that. Uh, you can use the now nowadays uh, you know you know pathology is an ex vivo method what happens is uh, the tissue sample is taken out of the patient right and then it's processed outside the operating theater but now the big uh, the big thing that they're moving to is something called label free imaging you know while the patient is on the operating theater uh, sorry is on the operating table uh, when you have it open and you can look at the um, at the tissue samples, can you use a probe and then apply something like infrared radiation or um, something called stimulated Raman spectroscopy, which is what uh, the lab I work with deals with? Can we then, you know, use that to to sort of on the hospital, uh, or oh, sorry, on the operating table, produce the pathological image, uh, the histopathological image? So, what you mentioned about um, you. Know, you know, uh, we need more pathologists for interoperational rapid diagnosis. AI pathologist is actually something that's appearing. You were journal articles. I'm getting a lot of very nice comments. <laughs> I, I I will respond after this. I promise. It was, and I do encourage more people to to come up, um, especially if they're 
is there graduate students walking uh, coming in? Um, I think one of the biggest concerns is that you don't have the expertise needed to, to um, you know, do these presentations, which is a good thing because it forces you to be resourceful and to go onto the internet and actually look for those answers. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea to have these talks, not just, for, not just for the audience, but also for the presenter. I agree. Um, actually, if we're having a computer vision part two, um, in relation to what Phil, Phil has just mentioned, we can actually talk about things like general adversarial networks. That's also a very interesting thing. Um, it's where a computer has already learned how to, put, how to diagnose images and what they look like. And it produces images of, the, of you know, those classes. It generates uh, artificial images. Computers can now, after learning about, you know, after looking at avatar images and also on and so forth, they can generate artificial images of humans, uh, of, of people, of, uh, you know, of objects. They can do those things. And that, uh, that is also a very good, um, a good method of evaluating an AI network. It's to have, a, have it, because teaching is also like showing, right, what you know. Uh, and uh, that's also a very good link to, to you know, a, a, the next presentation. But you'll have to wait till my research goes to that level. <laughs> I, I would very much for my next paper like to explore um, GANs and other advanced techniques. Um, a phantom it would be interesting, wouldn't it, right? Uh, you know, it takes the inputs from an MRI image, it knows what the components are, and then imagine if it starts to 3D print its own uh, phantom image of a, of a cancer, cancer tissue embedded within a brain. I think with advanced 3D printing techniques, it might, it might be possible for a computer to do that. That'd be interesting. Uh, I know my, I know I, I think I have some friends who are working in advanced manufacturing. Maybe I can ask them about it, but yeah, phantoms are, phantoms are used to evaluate um, imaging technologies as well. So if you can produce a phantom, it would be interesting. You could probably produce what Shiloh mentioned, an artificial tumor embedded within an artificial brain then we could start asking ourselves questions like the matrix, right? What's real? How do you define real? <laughs> because everything, everything would be, uh, yeah, we'd be asking ourselves a lot of questions. Thanks, Dezio. Dezio. What happens when we listen to, oh yeah, I could. Um, you could do a functional MRI, right? Because MRI, uh, 
MRI imaging allows us to see uh, neural function. So um, another another method that's also being used for for de the detection of neural function is uh, let's see uh, optical diffuse optical tomography. Um, and so so what that uses is infrared in the within the brain. So when you're, you know, when you're thinking or you're using a certain a certain part of your brain, when neural activity is is going on, you know, blood circulation might be altered, and it's also able to detect that. And you could definitely you could definitely apply a deep learning technique to to sort of see if you get enough data. I think. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm not directly involved with the, the imaging research. Um, deep learning, as far as, as my research area is concerned, I think it's more of a supplement. Um, the, real, the real sort of um, advancements are, or the interesting advancements are the, the technologies that are being developed to, to you know, use the, to, to, to detect humor, for example. Um, those um, the ones that use lasers or uh, that sort of thing. That's more. That's actually more interesting. But I just um, you know uh, um, manage the large amounts of data that we're getting in the present age, or that we have already collected in the present age. So it's more of a supplement. I would think of it as a supplement. It's good to have it in your. It's good to have it as a data analysis tool. Yeah, I would. I I have a grandparent with dementia, and I know how bad it is. So it would. Uh, I use it not only to. I use it for a uh, picture analysis. The the way I use mine is uh, I I take patches from the the H and E uh, sample images, and I. Yeah, I think after this this question we can round up. Shantal, thank you. Uh, so those those tissue sample images, what I do is I I actually, oh gosh, once you keep kicking on this, it just does it on its own. But uh, ah, okay. So those uh, by the way, these are open source images. These are not patient samples. In case anyone gets triggered, uh, these are. I got this from a free repository on uh, so I what I do is I, I take small patches of images from these uh, these larger samples of tissue and I do a patch. Thanks CCG for coming uh, see you. Stay healthy. The I I diagnose the I basically send those patches into a CNN. Um, but I've also done I've also done cell detection um, to study the shapes of individual cells. Um, that study didn't go so well because there was a lot of heterogeneity, like I mentioned. So, um, an, uh, an AI algorithm, an AI CNN to recognize cells is a, it's called UNET. UNET's the network that's very popular currently to for solve cell recognition and segmentation. I That architecture I've used before. Yeah, I think 
on that note, yeah, I, um, it was 17 a.m. in Singapore. <laughs> the coffee hasn't worn off, and, but you know, it's, it's been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Shiloh, for coming. Um, thanks a lot, Shantal. I, I, I don't know how, how to thank you for this opportunity. I hope it's been a good lecture. It really was fun going back to and delivering this, even though it's a lot nerve wracking the first time. Okay, let me pick up my stuff so. Hello, Fel. How are you?
I think it was very uh, good presentation because I uh, uh, read the, the notification or uh, the notes uh, in chat.